The second one is uh, through analyzing your gut microbiome, mm-hmm. which is done through a stool sample. It's like, give me a piece of your poop, Patrick. And through the poop, we can figure out- I didn't expect that question yeah, to come out of your yeah. mouth, but okay. We can, we can figure out um, what animals are living inside your belly. Yep. It's not- it's not analyzing the foods and the content that we yeah. get that through blood. We see like you don't have enough magnesium or you're getting plenty of vitamin D. It's not that at all. This is saying what animals are inside your belly. What foods do those animals like? We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stopping. Today, we are going to repeat something that we did some number of episodes ago uh, that we called the two-minute drill, Mm -hmm. which is just um, a collection of questions that we've pulled off of YouTube comments and Instagram comments and emails and whatever else um, that we sort of called together, um, smashed a couple of them together to to make an interesting question. and the goal is just to get a two-minute answer from you on, I think we have I remember, I remember 10 or 12 I feel like I was trying to beat the clock. And yeah, you talked talking, really, really fast. I was talking yeah. really fast. So I'll, try yes. not, I'll try to beat the clock without talking <laughs> as fast as time. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so I'm just going to read. Um, gonna, these, que- these questions are kind of all over the board. Um, they're not uh, any particular subject uh, in terms of like competitive stuff or mm-hmm. business stuff. It's just sort of a collection of everything. So um, first question, what is your approach to athletes training when sick? Um, for example, if they have a cold or a flu, um, and how does this approach change when coaching your everyday athletes as opposed to Katrin? So I guess like if a member came in and said, you know, I'm not feeling so great, should I still work out versus Katrin, you know, two months before regionals or something, yep. or I guess there is no more regionals, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, okay. So the first thing I would go with, and this is kind of a common thing that people have heard, probably heard before is, uh, f- is it from the neck up or the neck down? Okay. If it's from the neck up, so think like uh, sinus or cold or headache or um, congestion or something like that, I would say you could work through it. You can come to the gym, uh, continue to work out. If it's below the neck, if it's like a, um, a, a, a chest cold, a cough, uh, a stomach, fever, aches, um, or worse, that's where you should not be coming to the gym for, and it's just for a bunch of different reasons. Um, the other thing I think about is people like say like, oh, I can think I can sweat it out, right? Mm-hmm. It is like I have a cold, but I mean, I'm sorry, I have a fever, but I can sweat it out. When you exercise, you're you're changing your immune system, and moderate exercise done consistently can boost your immune system. Lack of exercise or extreme exercise can diminish your immune system. So there is. Prudence to that. There is something to that. I can sweat it out because it can boost your mood system a little bit, but it's really light stuff. It's like going for a walk, sitting on a bike, you know, um, going for a hike, like easy, like doing some yoga, like some active stretching, like going and doing a CrossFit workout is probably not the best way to to overcome something that if you're not feeling well. Right. And what about like a what about it in a case where Katrin, you know, came in and and it's in game season, what that looks like now? And yeah, it's just it, like, doesn't oh, okay. it doesn't change. It doesn't change because we need to get her back. Like if there's if we're no pushing, reason to push through it. Yeah, just, if we're pushing yeah. through just to push through, and we put we dig a hole deeper, and yeah. it takes us longer to get back to it. Nothing changes there. I'd rather take this. Is my take on everything. If she is coming in and she's not feeling well, or we, something nagging injury, it's better to take the one day or two than it is to try and push through and turn that into four or five or a week. Gotcha. Okay. Second question is. Um, What advice would you give to a young athlete who uh, really wanted to become a professional CrossFit athlete, right? And we can figure out what that means, but mostly Mm -hmm. it means they make some amount of money by being a CrossFit athlete. Mm -hmm. Uh, Assuming that they're young enough that they're they're not really racing the clock yet, what does the path look like in your mind to quote unquote professionalism? Okay, so I think that the the expected answer would be things like get a coach, work on your weaknesses. uh, you know, get sponsors, uh, get yourself with a good competitor to train with. Mine is a little bit more deeper, like uh, like kind of like rooted inside the person a little more, which is um, how passionate are you really about this? Um, it's really hard to do what you're saying. Yeah. We all we hear all the time about the it's the one percent of the one percent. It's just it's hard to make money in this sport. It's hard to have that as a living. Now if 
if you're like, no, I love this and like, cool, that's phenomenal. I, I really like that. I think the next question is, if you love it so much that if you weren't successful, you'd still be happy with the outcome. Meaning that you dedicate three years to becoming, trying to get to the games and you don't. Would you look back on that with spite saying that's time lost that I wish I had back? Or is it about the journey is what matters and I would really enjoy my journey because I am so passionate about it? That's the first conversation I would have with somebody. Because the last thing you want is for somebody to go into this with like eyes wide open. I could be a professional athlete. I can make money, be my own schedule. And like, and that not work out like, well, then they're in a tough situation. Right. You know, it's kind of like you have to recognize the sacrifice you're making along the way. Like I want people to go to try to achieve their dreams and become Olympic athletes, become CrossFit athletes, become professional athletes, to start a business, to um, quit their job and write a book. Like those are amazing things. But you have to ask yourself if this doesn't pan out. It's this is beginning with the end in mind and it's expecting adversity and expecting to overcome it. If this doesn't pan out, am I okay? An example of that is like, let's say somebody like really doesn't like their job and they have this idea of opening up their own business and they're like really passionate about it. They talk a lot about it and you say like, okay, if the business fails, are you still going to be okay? Do you have a, and if the answer is like, yeah, I'm a 22 year old. I have no other responsibilities. I can, I can take that leap. Awesome. Take that leap. Yep. Well, if you're a 47-year-old and you have two kids going about to go into college and you have a lot of health care insurance and health care uh, insurance care and cost, <laughs> dot, 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 um, then it might be a different scenario, right. right? So it's kind of recognizing where you are in your life and if that's a risk that is appropriate for you to take. Gotcha. Um, next question is uh, kind of a two-part question. One, the first part is what is an ideal sort of weight for a competitor in terms of body weight. Um, and I know that's going to be a yep. little bit dependent, but um, if there is a way for you to it's sort actually, of- actually ideal, it's not dependent. Okay, so it's, yeah, part one. And then part two is we, we've talked a lot about um, if you need to lose weight or, or strategies to, to lose weight. Uh, strategy is probably not the right word, but, yep. um, but if you could flip it and what if an athlete, so there's the ideal weight, quote unquote, and then, okay, I'm, I need to gain weight. How do I do that without uh, eating like crap? I okay. guess is sort of the... All right, so the first part, what's the ideal weight? There's actually, uh, just like there's an ideal size for an NBA center, there's an, <laughs> ideal, there's an ideal size for a um, um, uh, a coxswain and crew, like there's yep. in jockeys and like every, yep. every sport has their ideal size and CrossFit's no different. Yep. For guys, it's about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and 195 to 200 pounds. Okay. If you're 205 pounds, you're a bigger athlete, if you're 215 pounds, you're the biggest athlete in the field. Mm -hmm. It's that that's it's that sensitive. And similar the other way down. If you're 180 pounds, you're a smaller athlete. If you're 175, you're basically one of the smallest athletes there. Right. Um, for the female side, that number is about 150. Um, 150 is where it seems like a lot of the athletes really thrive. You know, think of the Icelandics, yep. that the, all the all the Icelandic girls, um, Katrin, Annie, Sarah are all right around that 150 mark. Um, there are a couple that are a little bit bigger, like Kara Webb, and then there's ones that are a little bit smaller, like Tia. And mm -hmm. Tia is kind of the anomaly. Tia is, which is why she's so good. She's 15 pounds lighter than those girls and still wins the CrossFit total. Yeah, that's the recipe for something really special. Mm -hmm. um, and then if if an athlete recognized oh, that weight. and yeah. then wanted to gain some weight, would that, the the sort of implication in those in the questions that we got was without eating chocolate bars yep. every night, you know? Yep. So uh, to gain mass, to gain size, it's an it's a really uh, uh, threefold simple um, recipe, I believe, which is you have to meet a calorie surplus and you have to be taking in more calories than you're burning. We talk all we want about hormonal effects of food and yes, broccoli is better for you than Oreo cookies and um, there's probably different foods, you know, diversity, all that stuff. But Let's start there. You have to, if you want to gain size, you got to put on, you got to take in more calories. So the first thing is add 500 to 1,000 calories to your daily intake. And usually when I talk to hard gainers, people that have a hard time gaining weight, um, they say like, I eat so much and I, I'll check their food log. And it's like 2,200 calories. Mm -hmm. Like you, if you want to gain size, you got to really work at this. You got to put in a lot of more calories. The next one is um, a protein surplus. So take in more protein than you think that you're going to have to 
eat and protein in good clean sources, you know, lean cuts of meats and grass fed beef and fish and eggs and chicken and um, any sort of um, animal animal proteins. And again, the place to start there is a pound, uh, a gram of protein for every pound of body fat. That's the norm. So as a 175 pound athlete, you should be getting 175 grams of protein a day. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. If you're having, you know, five meals a day, that's 25 grams. Am I doing that right? No, it's even more than that. It's more. It's way more than that. So it's gonna be like 30, 35, 40 grams of at, at a at a sitting. So if you're having four meals a day, 40 grams at a time, uh, that's 160. Yep. That's that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. So you have to work hard at that. You have to be a calorie. You have to be a, a protein surplus as well. And the last one is um, do some exercise that uh, is hypertrophy um, centered, meaning. The goal is to grow bigger muscles, not just like what we always talk about in our sport, which is stronger, more functional. If you want to get bigger, you have to train to get bigger. There's a reason that football players train a certain way different than Olympic lifters because football players, mass moves mass, and their goal is to move the opponent and not get moved themselves. They have to be bigger. Mm -hmm. They're going to train different than somebody that's in a weight class specific uh, event where they're trying to get as strong as they can without putting on pounds of body fat. So do some hypertrophy for hypertrophy people know it's like uh, bodybuilding type stuff, um, and you don't have to go into like total isolation type stuff, but more like rest periods, um, more a little more isolation. Think about like uh, bench press. Still, it's still like the big movers. It's still squat, dead bench press, uh, row things like that, but um, more in towards like the. Three sets of ten, take things to failure, that type of stuff. I think Dave Lipson is doing a lot of work in that. Have you seen anything he's doing? I've talked to Dave. I hung out with Dave a lot at the games. He yeah. was here before the games when Camille was here. Oh, that's with us. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's put on uh, seventeen pounds in the last like six weeks. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. Completely switching gears. Um, we've talked about in the six past. Six weeks. I might be lying about that. Put on seventeen pounds, <laughs> like since regionals, maybe. <laughs> Um, we've talked about in the past <clears throat> sort of the Bergeron tradition of, or not tradition, but the Bergeron, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, of sort of coming up with a family, a set of family core uh, values yeah. and, and, um, talking and you, we've talked about like, you guys have like goals and those goals can't be CrossFit related and mm -hmm. going around and basically like doing a lot of work to, uh, think about bettering yourselves as a family. Yep. Um, so we've seen questions or I've seen questions about like, is there a format to that? Is that like, how would you, maybe a better question is like, I'm interested in that. How do I start? Like, what is the best place to start where it doesn't feel forced or doesn't feel like uh, I'm trying to? Yeah. Um, so the thing that we, we, we've we done for a long time is uh, monthly goals as a family. Yep. And um, as you alluded to, it's they can't be CrossFit related because CrossFit seems to dominate our lives. <laughs> and um, they have to be smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Every month, you share how you did with your goals with the other family members and whoever else might be there. We've had a lot of people join in this. Um, and the other people at the table grade you on how well you did. Hmm. Um, so that's one thing we've done. We've uh, In the last about six months, we've moved away from that and got more into talking about... Um, family values mm -hmm. and who principles and what do we stand for as a family. Um, but the place I would start with that is having dinner together. That's where, you know, we didn't do a great job of that. When we did family, the reason we did, maybe it's the opposite of that. Cause when we did uh, those family um, um, goals, goals yep. we didn't eat dinner together very often at all. Mm -hmm. So when we got together, it was kind of like, Oh, we're all together. Let's do goals. Gotcha. So maybe my advice is actually wrong. <laughs> um, but I do believe that when you eat together, um, I think the easy place to start is to start with uh, this kind of like uh, gratitude mindset. I, gratitude is so overused now. I, I, I kind of shudder every time I say that now. But this um, go around the room positive mindset mm -hmm. and share something that good that happened to you that day or what you're thankful for in your life. Yep. And just get people to start sharing things. Yep. Become more vulnerable. Become more open. And then from there, you can go into this either... Um, the, one of the two avenues we've kind of gone down, which is monthly goals, um, which is just a monthly thing. So it's not that like as powerful as um, coming up with together, coming up with shared family values. Like what does your family stand for? Who are you guys? So is it 
doing the right thing? Is it work ethic? Is it compassion? Is it um, taking care of other people? Is it honesty? Like, there's obviously no right or wrongs, mm -hmm. but what? Who are you as a family? And then talk about those types of things at dinner. It's what we do at our coaches meetings and all of our meetings. Yeah. Is we review who we are, what we are, and let's bring to light some of those examples. And then it turns it away from, you know, this Enron approach, which Enron's core values were all the things: honesty, communication, integrity, and excellence. That's Enron's core values. Like those are perfect. They're amazing. <laughs> they're the perfect. Like yeah. those. They're also home to like the biggest fraud in the history of corporate America. So core values mean nothing. They're actually they mean a lot less than nothing. If you post about them but you don't live through them, you become even more disingenuous and less trusted. So it's better not to have them at all. Honestly, it's better not to have them at all than to spend time and debating over the right where ones are and then just not live through them at all. So the way we live through them is we talk about them. We talk about them a lot. Mm -hmm. At every meeting we have, we start the meeting off with the review of what they are. At our family dinners and in the um, our kids, we ask them what they are. You know, it's um, and they'll get them confused and like Harley, who's four? Because yeah, I was gonna say you're okay. <laughs> yeah, she's four, but she's yeah. like we're like Harley. What's one of our family values? And she'll be like, suffer in silence. And we're like, no, it's not. <laughs> that's awesome, <laughs> but it's not suffer in silence. But that is a good one. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Um, switching back to to uh, in the gym. Um, how how often should an athlete uh, go to that quote unquote dark place in training? And you can maybe define how you would say like, okay, yeah, you went there or you didn't. Okay. Um, so I think people, uh, when you're training, there's this thing called, there's a threshold. There's a, re there's a line. There is the knife's edge. You call it whatever you want. Um, before you go up to threshold, you're, you're, not in, uh, you're not very uncomfortable. You're working hard. So maybe your heart rate is up and you're sweating. Your legs are burning a little bit. But you're not at your threshold. It's not like, it's not the edge. When you're training at your threshold, call it your whatever. It depends on what you're going for. It might be your aerobic threshold. It might be your anaerobic threshold. It might be your lactic threshold. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, when you're at that edge, that's when you're making the greatest gains for what you're trying to achieve. That's, that's the place to spend all of your time. He who spends the most time at that threshold makes the greatest gains. But there is the time and a place to kind of tip over mm -hmm. every now and then to get really uncomfortable to get a lot of pain to like not be able to recover from the workout to know like you're laying on the floor you're seeing stars you can't remember your name your heart is ripping through your chest you have battery acid in your legs you try and stand up you can't take two steps you sit back down for some athletes it's appropriate to go there and i'm saying some because i would never ask my grandmother to go there right. that'd be ridiculous i wouldn't ask somebody that's you know, hypertensive to go there. I wouldn't ask somebody that's battling some sort of other things to go there. But the closer you are to your physiological and psychological um, peak, meaning like someone like Katrin, I'll bring Katrin there as we lead up towards the games a lot more frequently. To give actual specific, um, in the early part of the season, I hope that she doesn't go. I try not to get her there. So up until January, I try not to get her to go there. As we go from January closer to the games, that becomes more and more frequent. Mm -hmm. It's not every day. Trust me, it's not an everyday thing, but it does become more frequent. Um, it really depends on the athlete's goals, um, their physical and psychological tolerances. So if you bring somebody that is uh, mentally really strong, like we have, a, we have an athlete, Connor, who's at, um, going through, he just went through, congratulations, Connor, just went through uh, Navy SEAL head week, Hell Week, yep. um, made it through it. It's amazing. Connor, if I was to do that with Connor, um, his um, psychological tolerances are so high that his physical tolerances can't match it. You know, the, the saying is your, your mind will give up 20 times before your body will. Yeah. Uh, that's not the case for everybody. Right. When I push him, um, he's been... Um, taken out an ambulance. Like, honestly, he's like, during an open workout, <laughs> this is a funny story, actually. So it's, uh, he's he's trying to make regionals. He's, it's the final open workout, which was the thruster burpee that year. Yep. Katrin doesn't know Connor as well as we do. Goes up to Connor, and she's friends with him. He says, Connor, you have to die in this workout. <laughs> and, he, and him, he's like, roger that, Katrin. Yep. 
um, he got taken away in a stretcher. Like the paramedics came and like his eyes rolled back in his head and he started convulsing. It's like, you can't push someone like that, like that because they'll go to this place that they're not supposed to go to. Mm -hmm. um, similar, there's other people that if you push them, I already mentioned some like, um, like my grandmother, physical tolerance. If I push her there, she might not come back at all. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So you have to know the athlete. What are their goals? The other ones are like, they're here for the best hour of their day in the social component. If I push them, they're not coming back. They don't like that. So it's a really, it's a great question because it matters. Um, but it's really, really dependent on who, what, where, when, and why. Right. Right. Gotcha. Um, okay. Uh, what are three books that you think everybody should Everybody should read at least once. Okay, that's um, it's a really hard question because <laughs> it's only three books. Yeah. Um, um, I would I would have to start with like the go to that I always say, which is um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I just think as you read any um, book that talks about self betterment, whether it's time management or how to talk to people, they're kind of stealing from that. Mm -hmm. It's like so that'd be my first one. Um, the next one would probably be, uh, I have two in my mind right now and I might choose both of these. Um, the Obstacle is the Way by Ryan mm. Holiday. Yep. I think that mind that mindset of, um, I, I can do this and like uh, it's supposed to be hard and that's okay. It's also, it might even be a great thing. Um, the other one I have in my head, which was like, it was someone's is Mindset by Carol Dweck. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, I would pick one of those two if yeah. I can kind of like cheat the system a little bit. Yep. And the third one would be uh, Dale Carnegie's um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because if you people understand how to communicate with people, your life gets a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. The only one that I thought maybe you would add to that is uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah. It's, it's a good tough. one, Patrick. Three, three books is three tough. Three books is we, tough. We gave you five. <laughs> ah, Victor Frankl's so Man's Search for Meaning. It's a good one. Okay, next question is um, for people who feel like they've got some food sensitivity issues, what um, what recommendations would you give them to actually figure out if they do, um, you know, maybe they have a gluten intolerance or maybe yes. some, something else. Is there, are there tests, are there, you know, yes. blood tests, whatever it is, how, where would you point people towards? All right, so here's what um, we've kind of learned through this is like people talk about elimination diets. So you do an elimination diet, which means you kind of like pare it down to almost nothing. Yeah, so something like Whole30 or something. Yeah, like that. and then you add foods back in. Yep. The problem with that is, through the tests that I've done, is some of the foods in the Whole30, <laughs> some of the foods yeah, inside they, the elimination are the bad ones. Yep. And then there's so many other factors going on in your life. Like all of a sudden, now I'm going to be training more. Now I'm going to be training less. And you have a baby. And now you have a new job. And you're going to be traveling a lot. It's like, And people are like, well, you just use how you feel to judge. And you know, you're in a different training cycle. And you can like... I've tried it and I can't figure it out. I can't do hmm. it. I can't do an elimination diet. I can do it. I can, I've yeah, tried all those diets. Yeah. Like from a discipline standpoint, I can do it. I can't figure out the foods from it. Gotcha. And the example I'll give of this is I tried the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. The I ketogenic diet. <laughs> so the ketogenic diet is basically you have like no carbohydrates and you're fueling yourself primarily off of fat, and primarily MCT oil. So I do this and... Um, holy crap, I feel really bad. Like whether it's the keto flu or not, I don't know, but I try to get through it, keep going bad. I'm like, man, maybe I'm just not getting enough. So I get like more MCT oil and I get so not doing enough. Well, MCT oil is really good for me, so I'm gonna do some more of it. And I did, well, the, long, the long story short is I've since done a number of tests. MCT oil is essentially toxic for me as a human being. <laughs> gotcha. So, but you, you go on any internet blog, go on any health, and MCT oil is the God's gift right. to like mankind to yep. like make you healthy. I never would have figured that out on my own by doing that. So I'm not a fan of elimination diets. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm a fan of eating real food mm -hmm. for sure because there's one thing we know, whether you do these tests or not, I can tell you straight ahead what foods are going to be bad for you. It's going to be any processed food. Yeah. Like we're done there. Like yep. there's going to be no processed food that is good for anybody. Now, I'm not talking about like, rice like rice is like i'm not talking about rice food i'm talking like ritz crackers yeah. like i'm talking about like come in a plastic yeah i'm yeah. talking about like sour patch kids yep. like you know those things are going to be bad for everybody across so you the don't world. need a test to you know don't need that. a test for that <laughs> but you do need a test for here's 30 percent of the population have an adverse response to spinach really spinach is toxic for 30 percent of the population now you would never know that because they'd say eat spinach and then try to eliminate these things. Yep. Eggs is hugely allergic for most people. 
you know, yet if you go on the latest, it's just like you have to get tested. Yeah. So there's two different ways you can get tested. The first one is through like a, uh, you can go to an allergist or a functional medicine practitioner and get literally an allergy test. Mm -hmm. Like what foods do you have allergies to or sensitivities, yep. you know? And that's where people find out whether they're like celiac or they have gluten insensitivities. That's how they figure it out. It's a blood test. The second one is uh, through analyzing your gut microbiome, mm -hmm. which is done through a stool sample. It's like, give me a piece of your poop, Patrick. And through the poop, we can figure out- I didn't expect that question yeah, to come out of your yeah. mouth, but okay. We can, we can figure out um, what animals are living inside your belly. Yep. It's not it's not analyzing the foods and the content. That we can yep. do that through blood. We can see like, you don't have enough magnesium or you're getting plenty of vitamin D. It's not that at all. This is saying what animals are inside your belly. What foods do those animals like? If you give them, I'm realizing now that I'm going way over the two minutes. That's fine. If you give them the foods you like, you get all of the benefits of good health. If you give them the foods that they don't like, you get all the negatives. So everything from like better or worse immune system. Think about like getting lean or getting fat. Think about like recovering well or not. Think about becoming sick or not becoming sick. Think about like disease versus not. Living for a long time, not living. For, like mood, cognitive function, you know, um, gastro distress. Like all of those things are a fun skin. Like it all comes down to those guys. So mm -hmm. um, I don't really remember what the question was, but it had something to do with like uh, sensitivities kind of and tests? allergies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so here's the two suggest. tests I would do is, yeah. an, is a food sensitivity slash allergy test yep. done through an allergist yep. or a functional medicine practitioner um, or integrative health, that whatever they're calling themselves now, and, and or um, a um, gut test, um, which can also be done through those doctors. Um, um, but there's the, the one about the gut thing is there's, uh, there's some, I've done about four of those companies, try to vet them. Um, and there are better ones and worse ones. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I can talk to you guys about a much better one real soon. Cool. That actually is, is great. Cause that actually feels like a, that could be bigger episode conversation. All to, that's so all be cool. So yes. we'll do that, uh, in a future episode. Okay. Next question. Um, sweat analysis, a thing, thing worth doing pipe. Um, yeah, so what sweat, what that means is just so we're on the same page, what yeah. that is, is you find out, um, they, they find out how much you sweat and what your sweat is made up of. It's a thing. Um, and it's definitely a thing for elite athletes okay. and it's, uh, something I would encourage. It matters. Um, cause we're looking for 1% mm -hmm. and if you cramp, if you become dehydrated or you become hypernutremic, too much water. Um, you're out of the competition. Mm -hmm. This is not a one percent thing. This is a huge thing. Um, but for normal people, no big deal. Okay. No, do, not a big deal. Um, but again, what it is, it's going to tell you how much you sweat. So how much liquid to replace? You need to replace about seventy percent of what you've lost. And then, equally or potentially more important, is what is your sweat made up of? The sweat concentration. So what are the electrolytes that you're losing inside of your sweat? And somebody might sweat a lot or a little. And somebody that might sweat a little is like, well, I don't even sweat, but their sweat might be really concentrated and they're losing lots of electrolytes. In that case, they don't need to replace as much liquid, they need to replace electrolytes. So gotcha. yes, it matters. General pop, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, next question is, um, how have you talked to people maybe at the gym, I imagine, who are, uh, who, who, whose lives um, are, uh, centered around shift work, something mm. like nurses or overnight, mm -hmm. whatever. How do you help them um, stay as healthy as they can knowing that the things are going to be a little bit screwy? Yeah. Um, I would have a real serious conversation about them about whether they quit their job. Mm. It's that bad. Yes. Yeah. And we've talked about the, the, the ah. what happens when you don't sleep. Enough. So that's yeah. where I would, um, and that's where I would start the conversation yeah. is like, is this something that is, integral to your um, survival mm -hmm. in your health because that's what's being sacrificed. Right. Shift work is horrific on humans. Yeah. Um, and shift work just to be just so- Which means that like sometimes you have to work through yeah. the night. Yep. You know, so um, sometimes it's a 12 hour yep. shift. And you know? for um, like not as bad for firefighters who can sleep and then get woken up, not a big, not as big a deal as say like a nurse yep. who has to be like, aware, like um, doing their job, like right through the night, right. particularly because um, firefighters usually have that nice schedule of like 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, uh, four days off. Mm -hmm. That's not, not nearly as um, horrific yeah. as um, my shift is from 11 at night to seven in the morning, mm -hmm. every night, five yep. days a week. Yep. Um, I would quit your job. Yeah. That'd be my answer. 
I'm not, I'm not let's not sugarcoat around it. Right. That's that what I would be. do. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, you- the other nap. The other one I'll say is like nap whenever you can. Yeah. Because sleep is sleep. It's not as good as circadian rhythms and going to bed between the hours of, you know, deep sleep between 10 and 2 and all things that really matter there. But um, any sleep is better than no sleep. And I would uh, take real naps. Okay, cool. Um, morning routines. Do you have one that you uh, uh, sort of tried and tested for you? Um, and if so, kind of roughly, what does that look like? And maybe what would you recommend a, a morning routine look like? You win the morning, you win the day. Um, I really believe that. I really believe that you should be able to put all of your important stuff before noon. Um, so let's start with the not to do list. The morning routine can involve like what you're not yep. doing. It can be an elimination type thing. You should not, and I know people have kind of um, questioned me about this before. You should not get on email before noon. Now, whatever noon, if you call it 1030, you call that 11, whatever it is. But like the first part of your day should not be checking text messages or emails. You are immediately putting yourself into fight or flight mode and dealing with the next fire that needs to be put out. Mm -hmm. You are doing nothing proactively, productively to move you forward as a human being. You are simply reacting to the things that are in front of you and checking down this list. Instead, push that off. It can get done and you can do it. Now people are like, what kind of job would you be at that you don't have to check your emails until 10.30 or 11 Mm o'clock? Just about every job. <laughs> if, you're, if your job has to do with any sort of growth, if you are going to, in any sort of skill where you are going to try and get better, it should come secondary to that. You should be working on getting better. Because otherwise what you're going to do is, it's more like Warren Buffett's um, saving versus investing. What most people do is they spend their money and they invest the leftovers, mm-hmm. right? What Warren Buffett says is save your money and spend the leftovers. It's the same thing with your time mm-hmm. is, Spend your time on the things that are going to move you forward in your career, in your relationships as a person. And the leftover time, do the urgent stuff. Mm -hmm. The stuff that like the emails and all that. Not the other way around. Yeah. So um, that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. Now, me specifically, yes. I I do have a morning routine. I've since got off it a little bit since uh, um, um, the games and the training and traveling, going to the Cape and all that stuff. My routine takes a major hit when I'm not in my routine, obviously. Yep. Um, and trying to work on myself back into it. But normally my routine involves, uh, I wake up at 525 every morning. I jump in the shower. I take a long shower. It's my time to kind of like wake up. I don't do coffee. So Mm -hmm. this is my wake up time. Mm -hmm. Um, it's usually like a 10 minute shower. Um, from there I, um, I get dressed, brush my teeth, um, head downstairs. When I get downstairs, um, I'll do a little really, really quick. I almost hesitant to say, call this. I'll call it journaling, but it's not really journaling. I do the um, the Daily Stoic journal. Yep. Um, so I read the Daily Stoic, and now I'm doing the journal. Um, it takes like two minutes tops. Yep. And the truth be told, I do it when I'm sitting on the toilet. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, it's like two birds, one stone, yep. and it's undisturbed, and it's like my time, and yep. like it's really easy. It's two minutes. Um, from there, I'll um, I do um, I'll, I'll pour myself a a kombucha. Mm-hmm. So I'm really into kombucha Doing recently. Yep. Um, I drink that on my way to the gym, maybe have a, a fuel for fire um, pre-workout. Um, and then I take uh, the 6.30 class. Um, to, to um, I do my training with the 6.30 class from 6.30 to 7, uh, sorry, from 7.30 to 8.30. I will um, do some extra training slash socialize. Yep. So depending on the day, some days like today, to, um, just hung out, with the, hung out with my friends that I worked out with and literally just sat on the gym floor for 45 minutes. Um, that's really important stuff. That's building great conversations happen there. I'm building, by the way, I'm at work. So this is like relationship building. Um, I'm finding out about what people are saying about the gym and all the rest. Sometimes I'll do some extra stuff. I coach class from eight, uh, 30 to nine 30, but I give myself a half hour buffer at the end of that to again, just talk and socialize from then is when I have, uh, my first, um, kind of real meal. Yep. So 10 o'clock, 10 30, that's when I, um, go through kind of my, daily, um, call it my daily, um, I call it excellent life organized. Mm-hmm. So I have this like uh, 20 point checklist of the most important things I need to do every single day mm-hmm. or every single week. And I kind of run through that yep. to make sure I'm kind of doing all those things. And that will lead me into certain things like write a thank you note, like, okay, and I'll write a thank you note, like um, check out the latest journal article and I'll re- research a yep. journal article, like um, contact one of my athletes and I'll contact one of my athletes. And that takes me the better part of an hour or so. 
Um, now I'm at 1130. Now it's time for email. Yep. Now it's time for a meeting. Now it's time for um, some business development. Now it's time for whatever it might be. But now I can do the other stuff. And in the morning, I have kind of planned my day, planned my schedule, whether it's in the shower or whatever that is. Check my, I check my calendar when I get out of the shower as well. Mm -hmm. So I know what's ahead of me for the day. Actually, before I get in the shower, I check my calendar. So I kind of think about things. Um, so I've planned my day, checked my day, uh, kind of meditated on what I'm going to be doing throughout the day. I have worked out and trained hard. I have eaten pretty clean already so far. I've built some relationships. I've planned out and done the most important things I need to do in the week. And now it's, you know, some also some personal development stuff goes into that ELO stuff. And I'm ready to do the tackle the the business stuff. And mm -hmm. I have the afternoon to do that. Very cool. Um, one thing to add, just in case you haven't come across it yet, is um, so the Daily Stoic is a book and a journal, but they also have a daily email series um, that's sort of separate and different. Mm -hmm. um, and just recently, uh, Ryan Holiday has started to release those also as daily podcasts. So it's oh, him cool. reading them. So they're like two to four minutes long because the, the posts are short. Oh, yeah. So that's, um, uh, but that's driving to the gym. Exactly. That's what I was saying. Yeah. That's actually, it's part of my new morning routine now because it's so short. Um, and it actually has replaced my reading the daily story. Yeah. It's so what I'll do so is convenient. driving to the gym. I have about a, a nine to 11 minute commute in the yep. morning driving to the gym. That's where I will uh, listen to an audio book or a podcast. Yeah. Um, if something really digs hard at me, I will um, literally pull over and write down the notes. Um, or I will just pause it and wait till I get to the gym and I'll be thinking about it. When mm -hmm. I get to the gym, I write down it notes in my phone. Right. Um, that's a huge part of my morning routine. That if that went away, um, like if, for example, like if I didn't have that commute, mm -hmm. I don't know how I, that's a really important part of my day. Yeah, and even though it's only 10 minutes long, it's it's enough to like- It makes trigger. me want to wish, I honestly, I honestly wish my commute was longer. <laughs> uh, like for real, yeah. if my commute was like 25 minutes long, yeah. I would love to be able to even get more into yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, saunas. How long huh. do you have to be in a this, sauna? I love this list. It's just yeah, like this completely board. I didn't, of, I didn't work at all to make these related at all. That's no, great. Um, saunas. How long does a person have to be in a sauna before they start releasing HGH? Okay. So um, a little back uh, info on this. Yep. Um, HGH is human growth hormone. It's a precursor to another hormone called IGF-1, insulin growth factor, which is responsible for like keeping you young and keeping you strong. Yep. Um, so it's a cool thing. We know you get it through high intensity exercise. That's why we like CrossFit. Yep. You also seem to get it through the certain sauna exposures. Um, the question was how long? How long, yeah. Um, it's uh, the, this, the sweet spot seems to be about 30 minutes. 30 minutes um, of continuous exposure, not breaking it up, not 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, but 30 minutes of continuous exposure. And it should be above 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, last question that I've got, um, a common, I don't want to call it a complaint, but a common uh, point that people make is that uh, being a member at a CrossFit gym and eating at Whole Foods are both rather expensive uh, hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this question came from a college student. So let's, let's pretend it did um, in case it didn't. I'm a college student. I can't afford a CrossFit membership and I can't afford to eat at Whole Foods every day, yep. right? How do I try to, how do I maintain, or how do I get close to these principles that you talk about a lot um, with that sort of in my way? Um, if the, if a college student approached me with that question, I would, um, I would counter with a discussion about his mindset. Mm -hmm. um, he's looking for obstacles. It's, if you're a college student, this is the, you're, you're in one of the easiest places to do this yep. ever. You have a free gym membership. And you have a cafeteria. Yep. Like, dude, you have free food. Essentially, I know you're on a meal plan. You pay for it. And a a, a, a really probably pretty decked out gym. Yep. Um, you have no obstacles. Like, it's it's really, really pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, it, talk to me if you're an astronaut. <laughs> like, there you have some obstacles, right? You're an astronaut. How do I eat clean? How do I work out in space? I get that. That would be my first discussion. Now, um, let's go with the let's go with the college student. Let's break down why it's not. so. Go to any CrossFit gym's website in the world. You go to ours. We post the workouts for free. Mm -hmm. Like you can go to any site. If you don't want to go to our gyms, like go to CrossFit.com and there's a workout posted for free. You don't have to buy a subscription. There's no money out. Every day they're telling you exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. They're coaching you through a workout. So you take that, you go to your gym and you do it. So there's yep. the gym side. Then from the food side, you work at, you, you're at a, um, at a college with a cafeteria, eat real food and mostly plants, not too much. 
So go to the salad bar, get a salad, put some protein on it, get some avocado or some healthy, you know, some olive oil and chow down, dude. Like you good. Mm -hmm. Like it's pretty darn, it, that's really easy. That's somebody's looking for an excuse. They're mm -hmm. looking for what, this is why I can't do this. Yep. It's too expensive. I can't eat clean. I can't work out hard because of my environments. Uh, it's time to take ownership. Awesome. That's all I got. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for Yep. On the next episode of Chasing Excellence. My biggest responsibility is um, as a profession, I think I trade time. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I do. Wh I'm my, my, where am I putting my focus? Just like search for Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. And thanks.